Uh, the future of environmental philosophy is great. <laughs> Uh, there is a lot of possibilities for philosophers to contribute to complex debates uh, about uh, the control of nature, the decontrol, the lack of control of nature. Um, by definition, um, I like your question, what is the future of environmental philosophy? Because it's a future beyond environmental ethics. Um, it means a philosophy that's much broader than only ethics. It's a epistemology, a thinking about how we know things. Uh, it deals with ontology, about the activity of matter, it deals with history, uh, and it's by definition an interdisciplinary approach. So I see a lot of future, especially given the conditions of the 21st century, of the state of nature. Uh, and we deal with the question of the Anthropocene in our next question, but that itself uh, necessitates a complex um, uh, intertwinement of very different, not just disciplines, academic disciplines, but also an inter-institutional approach an approach to deal with environmental questions with all kinds of agencies, with all kinds of constituencies, with all kinds of practices, different places in the world, different peoples, different cultures. Um, and philosophy can bring a lot of um, content to these debates, uh, to this kind of uh, complexity of interdisciplinary um, contribution of the humanities. Um, so I see environmental philosophy as part of environmental humanities, environmental studies, um, and that part of a larger institutional necessity of uh, collaboration with all kinds of agencies within democracy, within our society, within natural uh, uh, practices, etc. So I see it as a very, very um, important contribution and growing contribution. Um, honestly, I have not been very happy with the term after a long um, intellectual debate and um, uh, struggle to show how a lot of our thinking is very anthropocentric uh, and our um, philosophical unpacking of those terms. Um, it's, um, it's almost ironic that we call the very, this very new geological era Anthropocene. Um, I would have uh, preferred um, uh, a term that um, um, that explicates more of a contribution of humanity to geological changes. So something like a symposine, <laughs> uh, sim being the um, the term for with like symphony, uh, sympathy, uh, the cum, the calm of community, of connectivity. Um, and in combination with the previous question, I think philosophy uh, really tries to think this reconnecting to our material world. Um, however, uh, the cat is out of the bag, the toothpaste is out of the tube, and so here is the term Anthropocene. What it does do is that it shows the, um, uh, the inevitable situation of a new thinking uh, that complexifies a simple narrative of modernity. Uh, a modernity narrative uh, based upon the enlightenment of humanity, uh, controlling nature through reason, and the, that kind of um, universal narrative is being, which is a narrative also of freedom, uh, that is now qualified and questioned by the notion of the Anthropocene. Um, and that's an important,
contribution to question that narrative. However, uh, as soon as we um, unpack these notions, we have to be very specific about which part of humanity we are talking about. And so the whole divergence, which is, I think, the main problem of our time between rich and poor, um, becomes obfuscated when we talk about uh, the Anthropocene, which is an, basically the way that Kurtzson and um, Strimer, uh, a chemist and, and um, uh, a marine scientist, framed the debate is a, a notion of human species. Well, that kind of obfuscate the fact that there are men and women, that are very poor, very rich people. Um, uh, it obfuscates the, um, uh, the contribution of industrialization, of capitalism. Uh, and so all these ingredients have to be unpacked in this soup of Anthropocene. Um, there are a lot of, of articles that are already unpacking that, uh, those contributions in the debate, and um, especially an article by Shabatri in, uh, I think, 2009, Critical Inquiry. Uh, he lays out nicely four different hypotheses, four different theses. Um, uh, Donna Haraway has a very nice piece uh, or talk about the Anthropocene in which she shows that it maybe it should have been called capitalist or um, I think she uses the term truly seen which uh, is ink fish or how do you call it uh, octopus uh, which I think is a very important contribution which I which relates to what I was just talking about about the necessity of the particularities that need to be unpacked in this notion um, so at one level we do phase up to um, a situation of humanity that is um, in a new situation of a profound global change um, but at the same time we need to uh, it's not a Hegelian universal it's not that that subsumes the particularities of um, the specificities of particular people or other entities uh, in time and space. On the contrary, we need to emphasize the specificities and, and find other kind of connectivities. Um, uh, that's what in my own philosophy I call the importance of this connecting, this reconnecting uh, philosophy actually as a, a permanent um, focus on the capacity of transitioning, of finding new connections, new Sympathies, new sim, new sympocenes, <laughs> in that sense. Um, so, a collaborative way between very different kinds of cultures, uh, including material cultures. Um, uh, so, if we are able to um, uh, to qualify the differentiations and divergencies with in the notion of the Anthropocene, it is fine, and it does put on the map the importance of um, the trajectory of industrialization and its limits towards the whole discourse of rationality and freedom and control of nature. And uh, that, that's a good thing that, that's been put on the map. But now we need to impact the notion and show it. Uh, complexities and its um, intrinsic contradictions and specifically uh, uh, the different contributions of different um, cultures of different um, uh, institutional structures um, and who is benefiting and who is suffering the most uh, even if the whole planet in the most catastrophic uh, uh, scenario which I don't know if we need to think already in that way and as such the whole um, setup of Anthropocene is a an, an discourse of catastrophe uh, that we are reaching our limit uh, but I think that that is something that we still have to see I think there are much more um, 
exciting connections, which actually Donna Haraway talks about, the uh, kind of possibilities of new strings of connections that mitigate, um, etc. Yeah, so my own research is uh, about water and culture, and specifically water and cultural diversity. Um, uh, and it tends to what I was just talking about with um, specificity that we need to articulate. And just talk about water and culture in general, uh, be nice to a very specific cultural diversity that is uh, at stake uh, around water issues. And again, the place of women and water uh, in. Uh, lots of cultures, w women are still the, the main carriers of water, and I don't know if you see it on the, our um, screen here, but in the background is a picture of a woman actually carrying uh, a bottle or how do you call it, a vase of water and feeding uh, or uh, letting the men drink. Uh, maybe it's wine, <laughs> but I assume it's water, and that's actually a symbol which is uh, very pertinent for the majority of the situation of women in the world that are the main carriers of water. And so bringing it back actually to the question of global warming uh, that's implied in the, in the Anthropocene situation, that has a major effect on uh, specifically young girls because it means that they have to spend uh, most of the time, actually, days of their life carrying water, bringing water back and forth from the rivers, from the sources to their families. And so that means no education, no possibility of other uh, development, of other skills, etc. Um, in 2008, I worked uh, at the UNESCO here in Paris uh, on a project that was called Water and Cultural Diversity. And uh, it was meant to set up within um, uh, the science, the water science, uh, pillars of UNESCO, uh, which is mainly peopled by hydrologists and uh, engineers, to set up a cultural component. Um, it was a very interesting project. It culminated in a book that's called Water and Cultural Diversity, and um, uh, which is accessible free online. A uh, beautiful book with multiple contributions from all over the world about the specificity of people working, uh, of people and their culture around water and their practices around water and their legal situations uh, and so forth around water. Uh, another important thing for me is that, um, uh, that a lot of these urban spaces and in general natural spaces and definitely water spaces uh, stay public spaces. Uh, and that's such an important theme, I think, for political philosophy, for environmental philosophy, should be political philosophy. Um, uh, because what you see, as soon as a certain um, uh, natural space, like water bodies, like rivers, like lakes, like uh, coastal regions, uh, become attractive aesthetically uh, for creation, for tourism, they become privatized. Uh, and so it's very important to have a political connection, to have a political uh, decision-making process and a lot of these spaces stay public spaces. And we see it right here in Paris, like the, uh, the Seine is just beautiful public space. Uh, lots of people, lots of different cultures uh, uh, hang out there at night. And uh, it's for them, they're, virtually only open space, like given the small, very expensive apartments in Paris, you need public space, you need public parks, you need public water bodies where you can relax and meet the unexpected. That's what I call in some of my work, the accidental wild, like uh, the accidental wild is not only the unexpected presence of birds or salamanders that can be in a place that's created as an open place, but also unexpected meetings with people, with other, with other cultures, uh, with other entities, with other material practices, with seeing birds, seeing, feeling the waters and so forth. It's all not planned um, uh, specifically for that, but that's a 
consequence from the from the presence of public space. Um, Sometimes parks are planned for that reason, uh, but I think a lot of, uh, and that, that's another kind of theme in my work, a lot of definitely infrastructural space is first and for all planned for uh, definitely on water, uh, on, the, on the level of water infrastructure for dealing with flood waters or drinking waters, but we can plan them in a way that they at the same time provide some kind of public space, so I'm thinking of uh, flood control structures and uh, there's a lot of um, interest in that to design them in a way that they are at the same time a park and not just a concrete ditch. <laughs> they can be designed in a way that they are uh, affording open and public space. Uh, and so it's, it's one of the examples of that what I call symposine in which we actually can deal with a lot of our necessities uh, we need as human as, as uh, uh, an urban population we need safe drinking water it's a big issue we saw that in Detroit uh, we need also safety against floods and so forth so we need very very good infrastructure that's a that's a, a sine qua non uh, but how do we design those infrastructural entities there's a lot a lot of rethinking possible. Um, I'm also thinking of like redesigning say the, the large infrastructural features like uh, uh, the wastewater treatment plants. Uh, right now they are usually like huge plants. We could design smaller units uh, so people are more aware of when you flush a toilet it doesn't just go into the universe. No, it goes through it the plan that's like a couple of streets further and it can be designed with a little bit more um, uh, bio natural features um, so there's an, an, an awareness raising which is an, a playful way of an awareness raising it's like where you also can actually see birds and uh, uh, of course it requires space and it's often not, not available in big cities but there's a lot of um, there's a lot of creative possibilities there and that's so I see environmental philosophy also um, uh, in an interactive uh, connectivity with say uh, architects uh, or uh, uh, including um, uh, landscape architects uh, uh, environmental philosophers can contribute to that discourse and so the interdisciplinarity is not only with other humanities or with the eco uh, ecological sciences, but also with the, the public space designers, uh, like landscape architects or the, the uh, architects of buildings. How do we design our buildings? Um, how do we deal with the, the water that comes from the buildings? Uh, how can we capture that? Uh, many, many fascinating and exciting possibilities of rethinking, reconnecting um, through our water management, but that management can, is not just a controlling of that water, but also an, uh, what I call um, a decontrolling, of course with the safety first, but then more playful possibilities of creating space with that flood water and, um, uh, and so I see a lot of fruitful possibilities and territory in these kind of interconnectivities and uh, what I call accidental wildness um, as a possibility of um, uncontrolling some of our controlling activities by giving place to certain processes to develop which will create an accidental wild of natural entities including accidental cultural wildness.